Hi guys, welcome back to my channel and if you haven't seen me before, my name is Ava and I'm a PhD student at UCL. So today I thought I'd do a bit of a different format and instead of just talking about research, I thought I should give some tips on to how to reduce sadness and depressive symptoms as well as anxiety symptoms during this time. Now these tips can be used at any point but I thought especially during Covid when we're more socially isolated, it might be good to have these tips. So I'm going to talk about four different factors that can affect our mood. So some of them might be unexpected and some of them might sound obvious, but please hear me out. I've tried to do research to explain why these are important and why we should focus on them. And even if you do think about them on a daily basis, you might not think of strategies in order to improve your mental health in relation to them. So hopefully I can provide you with some tips on ways that you can improve your mental health, whether that's the sadness you may feel, anxious feelings you may feel or anything. So as a tribal species, we had to cooperate as a group in order for us to survive and hunt animals that were larger than us. Now in this day and age, we don't actually need this physically in terms of hunting in a group and socialising in a group in order to survive. But we do need it for our mental health and that might be the reason why the prevalence of depression and anxiety as well as other mental illness have increased over the last few years and decades and that's because of our social isolated nature in terms of our increased use of social media and other factors such as not going outside as much. Obviously during Covid that's really going to increase a lot more so my tips are going to be specialised more towards isolation and how we're coping with that. So as a species, in order to reduce depressive and sad symptoms, there are four specific things that we need to look into. One is the need to feel like we belong. Two is the need to feel that our life have meaning and purpose. Three is we need to feel like people value us. And four is we need to think that the future makes sense. So now I'm going to go through these things specifically and tips on how to address these more in our daily life, as well as research that backs it up. So firstly, while research has shown an indirect effect of social support on depression, there is more of a direct effect and this is mediated by our need to integrate within a group and feel like we belong. So this doesn't just mean that we talk to friends all the time, we need to feel like we belong within a system or a group and we need to know our place within that. So a systematic review looking at 16 studies found that the typical population, so individuals who are not diagnosed with a full major depressive disorder, showed higher suicidal thinking and suicide ideation when they had a lower sense of belonging. However, the results were inconclusive because all the studies had different measurements of what it meant to belong. So in most studies, the need to belong wasn't just about the quantity of social interaction, but the quality. So one individual said it involves sharing a similar or complementary interest that allows you to feel part of a group. Obviously opposites attract and, you know, people can have friends and family that have completely different characters and they get along really well and have very good quality of communication. However, I think this, what this means is when you're identifying as part of a larger group, you need to see how you fit into it. So whether that's something that you bring that's very different or whether you have something of a similar goal in mind. So this could be having a reading group where you are all contributing to the same goal and have the same interest. And that's not so much about personality traits. There's also alternative literature that suggests that it's not just about the need to belong in the future or the present, but also our need to belong to a past. So I think what's important if you're not feeling like you're connecting with individuals at the moment is to just take a step back and think, where do you belong? So where do you belong in terms of your family? Maybe you could um, get one of those ancestor family trees or maybe just talk to your family and see um, what their history is like and how you're part of that. Also, you could think about your friendship groups, how you're part of your friendship group in terms of how it was developed, the way that you really communicated and started talking to these people in the first place. And any kind of group or social interaction that you might have, think about its origins and how it has developed over that time. This could also be how you're integrated within a work or academic setting. So maybe if you're at school, if you're at university or any kind of group or institution like that, you could think about how you're part of the institution, how you belong there, what you bring to the table and how you're part of it. So for me, I constantly see my identity now as working at UCL because it's what I do nine to five every day. And sometimes I feel like I need to take a step back and think about how I belong in that group so that I can kind of increase my social interaction with people at the university, even though I am communicating with them virtually. Research also shows that this is a cyclical process. So if you don't feel like you belong in a group, then you're more likely to have sad or depressive symptoms. When you have sad or depressive symptoms, you're more likely to be sensitive to the feeling of not belonging and the rejection or the lack of communication you may feel. 
and obviously that lack of communication can lead to more depressive symptoms. So really it can be a cycle and it is important to take a step back in order to cut that cycle before it carries on. There's also genetic studies and um, one study found that a specific gene showed reductions in serotonin, which is related to the happiness you might feel, which is a neurotransmitter, and dopamine, which is related to pleasure hormones. And having reductions in those actually made individuals more aggressive and more hypersensitive to the feeling of belonging. So this really does show that this sense of belonging actually is linked to serotonin, which is linked to depression. So now let's just take a step back a minute because we're at the end of this first step. And I just want you to think about this either now or in your own time. Think about your values, what you find important and how meaningful you would find them in other people. Then think about the friends, family and other individuals that you speak to on a regular basis or semi-regularly. And think, do they have the same values or interests that you do? And how are you similar to them? Are there ways that you can talk to these individuals more or have or kind of put individuals who have similar interests in the same group? Or if you don't feel like you have this kind of social network, are there ways that you can join one? Are there ways that you can join a reading group, a dance class, a singing group, mindfulness or yoga? Is there a way for you to integrate more in the workplace, even if it is virtually or at university? Um, and ways that you can belong. So this could be through Facebook groups or social media platforms, basically aiding in your communication with other individuals who share the same interests as you. So you can feel like being part of that group is another part of your identity and you see value in that. So while YouTube could be really good in terms of looking more into hobbies and having more of a routine, I think it's also important to look more to see if there's an alternative where you can interact more with people who also share that interest. So instead of going on YouTube and looking at a mindfulness or yoga session, see if there's any gyms that are offering free live sessions where you can do it as a part of a group with other individuals. Another tip that doesn't involve joining a group, it just involves you thinking about where you belong in a group and thinking about all the types of groups or situations and how you belong and how you add something and contribute to that. So maybe then when you're feeling a little bit low, you can go back to that idea of where do I belong? Oh, I'm actually part of this friendship group and I speak to them every now and again. And even though we might not speak that often, I feel like it's a really valuable time for all of us and I'm part of that or at your work. So even if you're not speaking to people that much during meetings, you can think, well, I am contributing my work to this. So I am still part of a greater system, even if I can't communicate with them every day. And the same thing with family. So the second thing is feeling like life has a meaning. So we have a chronic basic need, and that is to feel like there is meaning in our life. And this is associated with a lot of different mental health issues. So health, depression, anxiety, general life satisfaction, and a lot of other disorders. As well as feeling like our life needs meaning, we also need hope. So hope actually moderates the association between us having a need for a meaning of life and depression. So this hope relies on our confidence in being able to plan for a good, possible and personally meaningful life. So before we had a more concrete knowledge of what life meant because we basically just had to survive. We had to hunt, we, had to, we were part of nature and everything we did had a purpose, which was to survive. But now that we've evolved past that and we have a lot of other pleasurable activities, it's easier to feel like there isn't so much meaning in what we're doing day to day. So I'm just gonna read one quote um, that showed the reason why we need to have a meaning for life and how that can protect us from negative life stresses. So Frankel said that overcoming psychological painful situation requires the ability to shift from what do I want from life attitude toward a what does life want from me attitude and this will transcend our desire for pleasure or power and it's instead fulfill the unique human will to meaning to find the why in situations that are absurd so by that I think he means we need to be able to find meaning in negative situations that happen in our life as well as positive ones and as well as our general life itself so our ability to have a meaning saturated outlook where we're trying to find the meaning behind any kind of suffering that we, we may experience that is in our control will actually have a protective factor and increase our chances of being able to have hope for the future. So now I'm sure that you can think of a few things that you might think about when you're trying to see what your life means and I'm going to name seven factors for you to reflect on. So first thing I'm going to talk about achievement. Now, I'm not saying this in any specific order for you to prioritise, and some of these might surprise you, and some of these might be quite obvious. However, I know that achievement is probably a bit more of an obvious way that we can see meaning in our life, because we do live in a goal-orientated society right now, 
where there are certain goals that we feel we have to reach in order to be successful. However, achievements and goals can be anything from success in your life to meeting a new friend. So genetic studies have shown that a specific gene that increases serotonin and dopamine levels in the brain was linked to better school achievement. And I know there are other studies out there that link serotonin and dopamine genes to other types of achievement as well as just school achievement. So when you feel sad, maybe you should just take a moment to reflect on all the achievements you've made. Maybe that's just getting out of bed that morning. Maybe that's just cooking yourself a meal. Or maybe that's getting a promotion. It can be big or small, but I think it's important to recognise all the achievements that we have. And while we might not be able to achieve as much right now when we're socially isolated in our homes or whatever situation we are in, it's important to realise that there are smaller achievements that should also be recognised. So another one is relationships. So it, research has actually found that if you're more socially adept and you're more able to interact in social situations, you actually have an increased chance of living longer. There's also a link between having high serotonin in signaling pathways in your brain and being better in social situations. And by that, I mean the ability to maintain social relationships. So I think I know I've already talked a lot about communicating with other individuals, but hopefully this just shows you that it really is a way of seeing meaning in your life because we are social species after all. So another one is religion. And it's been said that having affirmative beliefs to a divine or upper being, as well as having a spiritual practice actually increases your mental health and makes you feel like there is more of a meaning in your life. Um, one way that this could be looked at is prayer. So prayer could be a profound meditative practice and it's been found that people who pray have increased activity in their prefrontal lobe which is related to concentration and attention as well as the limbic pathway in their brain which is related to regulating emotion. So it can actually be more of a mindfulness practice. Obviously this might not be the meaning of life to you, you might be an atheist or not believe in any religion or spiritual practice, well then you can do some sort of mindfulness technique which will promote the same kind of activity in your brain. So another one is being selfless so being able to perform selfless acts that don't benefit yourself so this can actually give you a meaning in your life as well and genetic studies have shown that individuals that had a shorter allele relating to reduced serotonin in their brain actually scored lower on selflessness in the personality traits so this just shows that there is actually a genetic link between being happier and having increased serotonin and being more selfless so maybe just think today about any kind of thing that you could have done that would have been a selfless act that would have made you feel good about yourself in a way. So that could be donating something or that could just be talking to someone and asking how they are. I think now, especially since everyone is isolated, there might be some individuals who are feeling more isolated than others. And it's important to reach out to them, not only for themselves, but also for you. So in a way, acting selflessly can make you happy as a person, which I guess is kind of selfish in a way. So another thing is self-acceptance in terms of understanding what your own limitations are. So setting high goals that you won't be able to reach in order for you to feel like you're successful and then being disappointed when you don't reach them is one thing that can really lead to reduced mental health, especially during a pandemic. So I know for me, I set myself really high goals and believing that that's the only way I can see meaning in my day. And then when I don't reach them, I get annoyed at myself for setting something that wasn't realistic. So I think being able to be aware of your own limitations what you think will be good for you to do in the day is really important. And research has found that individuals with panic disorder who were more self-accepting and knew their limitations and were more aware of them actually responded better to antidepressants that were specifically linked to serotonin. I know that serotonin is being mentioned a lot, but it really is an influential factor in all of these different things because they're all related to depression and sad feelings. Another one is intimacy, which might not be possible for everyone out there right now, but there are some things that I feel we could do if you are living alone or if you're not really being able to see anyone. So firstly, intimacy is important to talk about oxytocin, which is known as a love hormone because it's released when you do certain physical activities such as hugging an individual. So when you hug people, you have a release of oxytocin and that's directly been linked to anxiety and depression. So firstly, if you have pets and live alone, then I would suggest hugging your pets as much as you can. I know this sounds weird, but as someone who has two cats who are constantly on my lap almost all day, I really feel like having that physical touch, even if it is just something on my lap, really makes 
my mood increase and helps me feel more uplifted in the day. And if you are living alone and you're not able to get that physical touch at the moment, then I would suggest buying things such as weighted blankets. So weighted blankets are used a lot for individuals with anxiety as well as autism and all kinds of other disorders, but they're also really comforting. And I would suggest maybe having something like that to physically be able to hug or feel weight on you in order to calm you down if you're feeling anxious or maybe relieve any kind of depressive symptoms that you might have. And lastly, fair treatment. So believing that there is a certain amount of justice in your life and not thinking that things are unfair. So I think if you're ever feeling like life is unfair and it validly is so, it's important to think about how those unfair moments of your life have actually made you a better person. So seeing meaning in those things, in situations that are uncontrollable. And the only thing that we can really control is our attitude towards them. So maybe you could think about the kind of things that you pursue that you never thought you would during a pandemic, or the things that you value more that you didn't before. So maybe you are feeling like you're missing out on something, and instead of seeing that as a negative, you see that as a positive in a way that you're actually valuing something that you took for granted before. And I think also this relates to hope and having the need to feel hope for the future that things will change and that there will be a bit more justice. But it's very important to balance that with trying to see positives in a situation because you don't want to cling too much to the hope that something will change, especially if that's not in your control. So feeling like there is meaning in your life in any of these seven or other factors is actually a resilience factor and protects you from being at risk of different mental disorders. Third thing is feeling like people see you and they value you. So this is different to belonging in a wider group system because it involves feeling like you're valued by specific individuals. So examples of this could be feeling like you belong to a university or a company for a job, but not feeling like your presence is valued when you talk one-on-one -on -one or valued specifically by any individual when you're in a group meeting. Also feeling like you belong and identifying with a larger friendship group, but not feeling like you're really missed out by anyone specific if you don't attend something social. So one way that intervention studies have tried to reduce depressive symptoms in individuals who might not feel like they are valued is by doing socially prescribing. Now socially prescribing is when a GP or a healthcare service actually signpost individuals to certain social groups. So an example of this would be old people who feel lonely have actually been prescribed a social group where they were able to teach a younger individual how to garden. So not only does this elderly individual feel like they belong in a social group, but they actually are teaching a skill to someone else and feel valued by that person. So in a way, it kind of relates to the selflessness acts, but that feeling that you're valued by someone because you're teaching them something or you're providing something to them and you can see that that affects their life. So that could be just speaking to your friend and seeing how their mood is uplifted and how you're having a good bonding moment, or that could be at work where you're teaching a colleague a skill that they weren't knowledgeable of beforehand. Basically anything that involves you helping another individual and then seeing them feel valued by your presence. I think also social media can really help if you use it in the right way for this. So if you don't feel like you're valued in your friendship or family or work group, you can always join a Facebook group or something where individuals feel like they need help on a skill. So it could be some sort of craft or knitting or dance or anything like that or a mental health group where people are feeling a bit low and just being able to listen to them and provide support in any way, even if it is from a virtual stranger, you do feel a kind of value from that and it does help you itself in your day feel like you've had a purpose. So now I just want you to think about all the skills you have and how that might benefit friends, family, work colleagues or virtual acquaintances and maybe how you can focus more on that. Or I would think about people who value you compared to those who don't value you as much as you believe they should. And then think about whether you should kind of prioritize your time to those individuals. So the last one is feeling like you have a future that makes sense. And that's really important right now, considering the lot of the uncertainty we have at the moment. So the first tip for this is thinking about the things you can control. So for example, if you lost your job during the pandemic, you can control how much energy you put into applications, into CV writing and how you routine this into your day. So that is something you can control. Another thing would be if you're anxious about the pandemic right now, you can think about the ways that you can control your own physical health. So that might be washing your hands, making sure you're socially distancing, or maybe just increasing your vitamin intake. So having more vitamins in your day, making sure that your immune system is as high as it can be. And those are things you can control. 
So this will help you think less about the stresses that you might not be able to control and more giving a problem solving approach. When there is uncertainty in life, you might actually have maladaptive behaviours in order to cope with that. But I think it's important to take a step back and think whether those strategies are actually helpful or not. So these could be excessively seeking reassurance from others, micromanaging people, so you refuse to delegate tasks to others, either at work or at home. You may even try to force people around you to change to make their behaviour more predictable for you. Procrastinating by not making decisions you hope to avoid the certainty that inevitably follows and repeating checking things. So you call or text your family again and again to make sure they're safe, checking and rechecking emails, texts or forms before sending them or double checking lists. Now I'm just gonna give a few pointers of ways we can challenge maladaptive behaviors like the ones I've mentioned or other ones that you feel that you are doing because of the uncertainty of the situation. So you have to challenge these behaviours by asking yourself, what are the advantages of certainty? What are the disadvantages? Life can change at any moment and it's filled with unexpected events and surprises, but that's not always a bad thing. For every unpleasant surprise, there are good things that happen out the blue as well. A dream job offer, a surprise pay rise, or an unexpected phone call from an old friend. Opportunities often arise from the unexpected and having to face uncertainty in life can also help you learn from them and adapt, overcome challenges and increase your resilience. How much can you be absolutely certain about life? Does anyone have a job or a good health guarantee in their life? Behaviours such as worrying, micromanaging and procrastinating offer the illusion of having some control over a situation, but what do they change in reality? The truth is, no matter how much you try to prepare and plan for every possible outcome, life will find a way to surprise you. So let's not strive for certainty as all it really does is fuel worry and anxiety. And lastly, do you assume bad things will happen just because an outcome is uncertain what is the likelihood that they will? When you're faced with uncertainty, it's easy to overestimate the likelihood of something bad happening and underestimating your ability to cope if it does. But given that the likelihood of something bad happening is low, even at this precarious time, is it possible to live with that small chance and focus instead on the more likely outcomes? I think lastly, also just being able to sit with your feelings and acknowledge that feeling of uncertainty is really important, especially during this time when we have a valid reason to feel anxious or depressed due to the uncertainty around us. It's important not to uh, bottle those feelings up and release it in an unhealthy way, but more to acknowledge the presence of them. And this is also another feature of acceptance and commitment therapy, and I've linked below some resources for that. So I hope this was helpful to you. Obviously, it's really important to look at your mental health considering the pandemic we're in, but also these tips can be used in general life. So I hope that you found them interesting and the research knowledge that I brought to them shows that they are evidence-based. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please comment below. If you like the video, please subscribe and like. And if you have any ideas or future videos I could do, please comment below as well. So thank you very much for watching. Stay safe and healthy and I hope to see you next week.